Uh, well, I'm Trace Clinton. I work at a little flight school at Park 61. We do uh, mostly tailwheel, and uh, we do primary and, and uh, some other, other training as well. Um, yeah, come on in. Got one more. Get my numbers up. Uh, but yeah, with Burn, it's uh, near Austin, Texas. A uh, really pretty place to fly. Uh, it gets hot in the summertime, so I'll come down there during uh, July. Uh, we're going to give this away. This is a little Yeti adult sticky cup. Um, so uh, we're going to do it by distance uh, from home. So if you were to fly direct to here, um, anyone past the 500 nautical mile mark? Okay, good. All right. 700? From current home? Yeah. Uh, 800? 900? Where are you at? Chicago. Chicago? Dubuque. Huh? Dubuque. Which one's further? I think I am by Wolver, New Hampshire. That might hit it. Uh oh. How far are you? I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Get out of the <laughs> What's your airport? Yeah, well, let's look it up real quick. Let's yeah. see who's the first. Yeah. 800? You got 800 B? Oh, yeah. 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 Thousand sixty six. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. So you're awesome. the winner. Thank you very much. Cool. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have to see the song or something? Yeah. Oh, you no. Get to no. Here. No. <laughs> I, don't don't the I don't have to dance a waltz either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mine's not near that bad. Oh man. Roger had me score. No. Not. Uh, yeah, so we're talking about the fun factor. I was flying with Charlie Gregoire. Uh, you you met him. He's part of the Redbird team. Um, and he asked me to speak on this. We were flying in the Cub together. It wasn't his first time to be in a Cub, but he was kind of just reminded uh, that we were flying over the river and, you know, probably a thousand AGL and just, you know, it was a perfect day. He's just, this is great. This is just a whole nother, you know, different type of flying. And, uh, you know, he flies at M2 and he, you know, at flight level, straight and level, A to B. And he, was reminded that after he got his license and went through the system he kind of felt like there was only one way to fly you know a to b high flight plan you know very rigid and structured and and uh, there's different ways and so we're going to kind of talk about keeping the fun and flying um, plane and pilot uh, you you read their article and they say the average we just got started, you haven't missed a thing. Uh, the average pilot uh, flies about 35 hours a year, um, which is you know, probably two weeks for some of you guys. Uh, not a whole lot, you know? At the 35 hours a year of cooking, it would, I'd be a terrible cook. So uh, it's, it's something that we can improve on. Talking about the numbers before, you've seen the declining numbers. Now, the, air, the total number of pilots is increasing to try to meet the airline demand. But those are ATP commercial uh, numbers. The private pilot numbers, though, are decreasing. And FAA took a little break in COVID, and they didn't publish the 2021 numbers. So I guess we can forgive them, but they're probably just sleeping, I guess. But uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but the, you know, it's declining, and there's, there's reasons for that. Um, so why? Why do you think, you know, aviation, we're flying 35 hours a year, less pilots out there, who, who has any, any insight into this? It's your, your presentation. Of why fewer pilots were going? Correct. Uh, medical, basic med, helped reverse a little bit of that recently. Yeah, it could be part of that. I think that was a chunk of what do people mostly, when they come in to talk about flying, what's the two biggest things they are asking about? Or that's... How much, how much, how long? How much, how long, yeah, yeah. Did y'all see this last time? You pretty good. <laughs> uh, yeah, so time and money. And that's kind of our scapegoat. We say it's uh, it cost a lot, it takes a lot of time. Um, David St. George in one of the breakout sessions y'all may have seen, 
He said in 1970s, uh, the average cost was around $1,900. Today's money, that's around $15,000. So it's really been about the same for the last, what, 40, 50 years. So it's kind of interesting on that. Now, meth heads have all the time and money to go find meth. Why can't we find the pilots to go fly? You may have other problems. I'm sorry if you're uh, a once an addict. I'm, I'm happy you're here now and you're recovered. Uh, if you go to Disney World, I've taken my kids to Disney World, 19 million people a year. We just need 161,000 people to be a pilot. College football games at bottom number, 47 and a half million people made the time and effort and paid for it to go to the games. That's not including the 145 million fans that watched it. So understanding the data, anyone seen this diagram or, or analogy before? It's really interesting. Uh, during World War II, uh, they decided to, engineers wanted to kind of design the, air, the next airplane or, or retrofit the existing airplanes with more armor depending on what the data was showing of where the bullet holes were. So they started documenting where all the bullet holes on the airplanes were and they're going to start putting up some extra uh, thickness and armor around that area to protect the uh, aircraft and air crew. And this uh, guy named Abraham Ward, a Hungarian mathematician, was putting all this together and said, wait a minute, we're looking at this completely wrong. We need to look at where the bullet holes aren't hitting because those are the ones that didn't survive. They didn't come back and land and get the data from. They're, you know, you know, they're they're in a forest, they're in the ocean, they didn't survive. So you can see where the, the prime targets are, the engines, the cockpit, the middle of the wings, the, the tail gunner. So it's we think about it's time and money, and yes, those are variables and they're very important to communicate to our new students and very important consideration, but uh, there's got to be more to this equation here. Activities are up in the last year, you probably know that. State parks are hitting record numbers, people want to be outside. 8.1 million more hikers were recorded somehow, I don't know how they got that data, but it's reliable sources, I promise, not fake news here. Uh, and. I mean, even tennis was up. Anyone like tennis? I don't like tennis, but I like to fly. I don't have any kind of. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, business labor statistics. Can you say that for me? Statistics? Yeah, there you go. I said it. Uh, Americans have 17 minutes. They, they work 17 less minutes per day, and their commute has uh, shrunken by 26 minutes because most people are working from home now. So they've got more time, and to prove it, they're watching three hours of TV uh, a day this past year. And they're spending $18,000 on non-essentials. I'm not sure what non-essentials are. I, mean, I may you know, think it's essential, but maybe the business labor statistics doesn't think it's essential. I don't have no idea. But the point is, people have some time, more time than they had before, and obviously they're doing pretty good be spending. So the fun factor, why is it important and what is it? It's that push, the drive, the motivation to keep that student going. You've seen them kind of plateau out on their learning. We're talking about, uh, Roger said 60, I think I heard a number, another number saying 80% dropouts of not completing. Main point is it's a lot of people not following through, they kind of lose interest. So who is it? That's you, you're the fun factor here. And if you're not directly in the cockpit with a student, that's going to be the uh, instructors that are working for you. So they're the, they're the re person that's responsible, that has the ability to foster that ex aviation experience through the training. So it's important that that instructor, whoever has that fun factor uh, badge, they know that who their customer is. Uh, anyone come, like I think it's four years ago, CEO of Big Red came and did a keynote, talked about knowing your customer and uh, kind of rebranding Big Red and kind of kick it, kick, kicking it in gear and, and relighting the fire underneath the Big Red soda, you know, the, the drink. Um, he had a great keynote and he was just talking, he broke down Austin in probably five different sections and he talked about different people that live in Austin and they're so true, it's, it's like a mini culture of people all in one in a, in a town. So do we know our customer as well as we should have? Um, what is their plan afterwards? Are they going to the airlines? Because 
Someone going to the airlines, as you know, may be motivated a little differently, maybe more on a budget, uh, maybe driven by their career and not so much by what they're going to utilize the airplane for. Um, you know, what are their financial and time expectations? Uh, some people don't have one, and some people that's really important. Is it a tool or a passion? How do we incorporate this into our training, this fun factor that we're talking about? You've heard of scenario-based training. Um, you know, I want to I think about that scenario, and, and all scenarios are good, but sometimes as CFIs, we like the negative experience uh, scenarios, the ones that we try to scare the student. Oh, you know, hey, would you go up today? It's 900 foot overcast. Would you solo to, to your, you know, Fredericksburg, which is 50 miles away? And they say, yeah. And we say, yeah, let's go, and I'll go show you. And they get in the clouds, and they get scared, and we, ha, ah, prove my point. Let's go, Liam. You know, or the wind is too high, and they say, yeah, I want to go. And, and you know it's beyond their personal minimums, and they get scared. Or you take it just a little too far for their personal limitations. You keep it safe in yours. We do a lot of that, and that's good. We, we, uh, there, there's, there's times and places for that. But we can also do it on the positive side. We can have fun. We can show them what the airplane is used for. We can take them to lunch, go to a fun place. We can take drinks in the, in the cockpit. Not, not alcohol or anything, just, just uh, can't, gotta, gotta clarify that. Uh, but go land somewhere uh, different and have a, a debriefing over at Topo Chico. That's what I do on my, uh, on my flights. We do Topo Chico's. Anyway, I won't make it. Uh, define learning. Um, the best definition that I've heard of learning, and uh, you all probably, if you haven't heard, you understand and, and you know already. But it's a, a change in behavior and a result of an experience. And so if you set the experience, that can really reinforce this learning that we're trying to promote, right? And we're trying to motivate it through. So you can do that with negative experiences or positive experiences. Practice areas. So I worked at the University of Oklahoma for a while as a flight instructor. And you know, it was a different deal than I'm doing now. We had 13 airplanes going out, you know, coming back every hour and a half. And so we had to have a lot more, you know, structure to this um, training. And we had practice areas, and practice areas are there's a time and place, but just make sure that we're diversifying the use of our practice area. We're always going to practice area alpha, and they take off a of runway 21, and they hang a left, and they climb up to 3500, and then we start our maneuvers, and they come right back, and they, it just gets repetitive. And for that flight instructor, that also, I think, can attribute to their burnout rate. You know, they're doing that every day. It gets repetitive for them too. Mix it up a little bit, you know, keep it entertaining. It takes a little bit more effort, a little bit more thought on this, but keep it engaged and entertaining. Try something different. Know your training area. So these are all in my training areas and this is all during training. Uh, I do a little off airport and, and seaplane training. Uh, I got relationships with landowners to utilize uh, their fields. It was great. Again, it's tailwheel, and I understand it's different than 172, but I was working with a guy, we're at 3000 AGL, I pull his engine on him, he picks a field that I have permission to land on, he didn't know that at the time, and I told him to go ahead, and, and it's already been cleared, I've driven it, it's a known area, it's perfectly safe, and we land there, and he's like, this is awesome, I've never done this before. And I said, oh, me either, I have no idea where we're at. <laughs> and he, uh, he laughed, and I said, no, no, no. One day I want to have my, it's my dad, my family's field. I want to have my dad like come out in his underwear with a shotgun. Like, hey, what are you doing? I want to, so it's like, it's adding experiences to this. I didn't, I ended up telling him the, the full story of everything in my joke, but worked out great. And it kind of just reinforces a, a, a memorable time in their training. And by the frame, when it's appropriate, obviously we're not going to do it when we're stalling and, and trying to scare the student or anything, but when we can go to lunch or go go to a, a, a life event, um, it's great. Invite the family, invite their spouse. That's important to get the spouse on board, by the way. Uh, training to the syllabus versus to the student. Uh, we've talked a lot in in this uh, migration about needing a plan and how to better organize it. And plans are great. You have to have a plan, um, but. Again, knowing your student, what are they going to use the airplane for? Are they going to do long cross countries and go into busy airspace, or 
are they just going to get it and get their next rating go on to the airlines or maybe they're 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 a 16 year old kid that's you know uh, you know mowing lawns and he doesn't have a budget what what's what are they going to use it for how can you maximize their experience with your resources um, i flew over here actually with a student from texas we're about 950 nautical miles and uh, he actually came to me and goes, hey, Trace, I need to be in Florida. I said, oh, really, when? And uh, he said, oh, the week of February 7th. I said, I'm in, let's go. And so we flew here. It was his first cross country. It was a little out of sequence of what I would normally do. He wanted to be here for a week to visit with his family and everything. But um, it was great. It was a way better experience for him. We stopped along the way. His, his uh, son and daughter were with us. We ate uh, at a, a neat little airport diner. We hit a little bit of weather. We got a little bit of night flying. Got a whole lot of ATC time. And it will be something for his first cross country that he'll remember for his forever. Uh, so it's awesome. Um, yeah, 141 versus 61, I, I understand there's some limitations in your programs and you have to stay within the confines. But again, continue to be creative, think a little outside of, of the box there have options you know when they show up you plan to do a cross country but the weather to the west is crappy but you could do crosswinds and again take advantage of opportunities that present itself i think you already probably do that uh, for me as a 61 guy you know i'm getting paid by the hour and so to maximize my scheduling in the day is, is the name of the game you know you want to you want to try to work as much as you can to get paid for your day but you have to balance it to be flexible enough to allow for these different opportunities to present itself and and kind of go with the flow so it, that's just a balance thing and, and it's to me it's the most difficult part of being a cfi on the business side of it technique we can apply the fun factor and the different technique last uh, point down there think outside the acs i've heard that multiple times also through this uh, uh, migration uh, dutch rolls falling leaves anyone incorporate that into their primary training yeah it's not the bonanza you know flying the VTEL. it's a, a coordination exercise that you roll the airplane along the longitudinal axis hands and feet it's a great deal it sometimes makes people sick on blended horizon day so do it towards the end of the lesson falling leaf anyone do that yeah another really exciting uh way to to show stalls and you know you may not want to do it on a, a comanche or something but uh you know cessna 172 piper super cup awesome go try it by yourself before you do it with students obviously we wouldn't want to do that right off the bat with our students to introduce them to stalls but that's entering a power off stall holding the elevator all the way aft and maintaining control with use of pedal you kind of flutter lose altitude flutter and you're just keeping those wings level with using our feet um, it kind of roger kind of talked about desensitizing i believe um, in emergency or maybe it's jerry on that podcast it kind of gives them a releases a little apprehension to stay in that stall and get them comfortable with being in that configuration so they don't freeze and they can maintain awareness through the through the maneuver. Slow flight along a linear feature. When I was training in my private, we went up high and did everything. And you couldn't, you never saw anything on the ground until you came back to land. But you can find an appropriate altitude, an appropriate area, and find something interesting to track, like a river, a creek bed, a uh, you know, old county road or whatever, and and you know, be enter slow flight and get out of slow flight. Enter slow flight and get out of slow flight. You don't even have to go to the what the ACS says slow flight. You can stay you know 20 more miles uh, per hour ahead of what they, what you're supposed to be just demonstrating that kind of uh, use of hands and feet and pitch and power changing altitudes with ailerons that's a that's a easy one is you know not influencing the elevator rolling and uh, increasing and decreasing your roll and and uh, you can see your vertical lift component change and you increase and decrease altitude. So this inadvertent IMC uh, example is, is kind of neat. I really, really like this. I didn't, I would, I didn't do this in any of my training when I got my uh, licenses and everything. But uh, Ken Whitakin, he's a mentor of mine. I used to work for him about nine or ten years. Um, 
anyway he's he taught me this and I'm sure he learned it from somewhere else but so that's what ProMark is. I made this video like five years ago. What we're doing, we're doing uh, unusual attitude recoveries and we're finding a long north-south road and we're flying from the east to the west. Once they cross over the road, they close their eyes. We count for seven seconds. Now they do that in the video. And they try to make a 180 degree turn. So it's better than me on the controls and I go, all right, close your eyes and do hard left, pull back and recover and they know what, you know, they know what you're doing. We agreed to do it to the left, by the way. Anyone do this, by the way? Heard it? Yeah. So you see, it, you know, starts going right. Y'all seen the same thing. You're flying this little white sword you bought it's called a spin. You can't do it. here but um, and we that was uh, hang on uh, that was 2015 or 14 and uh, and he just reminded me of that probably within the last four months just just for fun a variation of that is have them they don't have to close their eyes just have them stare at their left foot and, get, and tell them give me a constant oh. give me a two minute turn to the left but stare at your left foot as if you're distracted. And I guarantee you. They get off. I, I guarantee you, even the best IFR pilot's gonna be gone. Yeah. If they're honest about it. They can't look at their instruments, just yeah. at their just foot. Their foot as if something, you know, yeah. They're looking for a pencil or something like that. Yeah, that's a good way to do 270 it. 270 degrees of turn at best. I bet you're right. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, and any of these are, are good. Any of these types of you know unnormal uh, activities to again enforce the learning. Going places, obviously, this is kind of a fun thing. Uh, this is why a lot of people obviously get their license. They want to take their family. They want to go with friends, and they want to get somewhere. Uh, so you know, selection of your cross country, not just meeting the minimum, but you know, if there's something interesting to go. 10 more miles and go to that one instead. Lunch stops are always fun. I talked about Topo Chico. I'm kind of obsessed with it. Uh, trust the science, kind of a bad term the last year, but uh, it's, there's some parts of that that would be true. Uh, this guy's supposed to be brilliant. I have no idea. I've never met the guy, but I did watch his TED talk and I read a little bit about him. Um, he's a Harvard guy. New York Times best-selling, which uh, again maybe not gives uh, too much credibility, but anyway, uh, he, he calls it the happiness advantage, and uh, you know I'm calling it the fun factor. I think it's pretty similar, but the claim uh, that when we're having fun, when we're doing something that makes us happy, our brain and our body creates dopamine, and that opens up all of our learning receptors. We're receiving information better, um, and conversely. When we're in a stressful situation, we actually start shutting down things and our mind goes into a different, uh, we heard uh, McSpaden talk about that 
uh, earlier. And it's very interesting. So when you put your student in that stressful situation, again, there's times and places to stress them and push them um, so they can see for that for themselves. But there's also good ways to do it. And that's, you know, according to the science, it says uh, it's a good thing. And I can attest this because I work at a camp. It's a summer camp uh, near um, Burnett, just west of there. I'm one of their directors, and we have a lot of activities. Uh, we have the blob, you know, that bag of air that floats on the water, people jump on. And we got sailing and skiing, scuba diving, uh, lazy river, all of some of our, our higher end activities that people put. And after each term, we got about 6,000 kids a summer. And after each term, we survey them. What was your best activity? What was the worst activity? And hands down, kayak or canoe, depending on what location you go, um, is some of the worst activity. I mean, that kid can't even hold it right, right there. He's doing something weird. So it's not even been taught correctly. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. It's, you know, it costs a lot. Those kayaks actually cost a lot compared to some of our other activities that are more fun. But we had three counselors in three different terms in, in several years apart. And one was named Ben, the other Char, and the last one was Kay. And in each one of those counselors, when they ran that activity, it was one of the best activities. Um, the kids loved it. It went from at the bottom, and we probably have, you know, 18 different activities. Went from the bottom consistently, but when they ran it, several terms in a row, at different years even, when they ran it, it was ranked number, you know, in the top three, maybe top five. And the testament that we tell our, all of our counselors at the very beginning at our introduction is, hey guys, you make this camp. You're, you're, you make or break the experience that these kids have at this summer camp. We don't have any Disney World characters or any cool, you know, Universal Studios, you know, million dollar rides. We have you guys. And y'all influence the experience. And it's so true because Kay, uh, Ben, and Char all did fantastic jobs at those activities. And we can also do that as, in a, as a CFI. So we talked about what we're doing during training, but again, they get their license and they go and they go fly their family and it goes back to that 35 hours a year is not a whole lot. Uh, so what we need to be doing also during the training is kind of talking about the next steps and a, a great way to, to continue to maintain contact with them uh, is, hey, call them up, ask them, you wanna go take a trip? Uh, I need to go to Florida. Anybody wanna go with me? Uh, you have a free ride for me and you get free instruction, maybe work a deal that way, organize a trip to Idaho, go to the Reno Air Races. You know, it doesn't have to be necessarily training. It could be just experience space. Takes a little bit more time. I get to move cubs around the, the states for cub crafters and so I get to go to see some really neat places. That's Salt Lake City when the, it's like this algae, the time the temperature changes and it turns the whole Salt Lake red. So it's kind of kind of neat. This is in Arizona. We'll talk about that here a little bit with the uh, airfield guide. But uh, we just camped out at someone's property that allows us and uh, it, was, it was awesome. Here it is, Airfield Guide. Anyone familiar with RAF? Yeah, Recreational Aviation Foundation. AOPA is kind of the voice for general aviation. They do a phenomenal job. The RAF is the voice for airstrips. Their, their mission is to preserve, protect, and maintain airstrips. And so there's this is like the Arkansas, uh, uh, Oklahoma area that I, I took a picture of. And all those little dots are these airstrips. Some of them are, most of them are privately owned. But if it's on the airfield guide, you can get permission to go land there. And it's not just used for these backcountry off airport machines. It could be a 172 Bonanza, even a Cirrus, you know, with wheel pants can land at some of these places. Um, you click on one where you, wherever you want to go and you can look at, look at uh, what's going on there, what the approach looks like. Hey, the neighbors aren't very friendly to the west, stay on the east side. What you can do there, you can light a fire, you can camp overnight, we got fishing available, you know, whatever activity is associated with that location. Really neat tool. It's free when you join the RAF at a free membership. Now, if you put your email in there, we're gonna hit you up for money for sure. I'm the Texas liaison, by the way. 
And so uh, this is my little commercial for the REF, but great resource. If, if it's just this piece, uh, it's worth joining the REF. Fun places to fly, real creative uh, website there. Uh, that, that's their funplacestofly.com. Um, you know, when you're going to these places like uh, Central Texas to here, you know, going to something like that and seeing where the best place to stop for lunch or neat, like Dolphin Island is a neat stop. Uh, it's off the coast of Alabama. That's how I found it on this uh, Where to Go. It's a little strip and it's fun to land there. Stay low. You know, we, we, we tell our students, you know, stay high, it's safer, it's better fuel economy, better winds. But when time presents itself and, and the area is appropriate, stay, stay lower. This is over Tucson of a Davis Monathons or whatever, the boneyard there. And I just asked the controller, can I get the lowest altitude, you know, right over the boneyard? And he's like, yeah, heck yeah. And he let me do it. I'm talking to ATC and um, I'm probably, you know, 600 AGL or so uh, over there. I felt like I was breaking the rules. Everyone likes to break the rules when you can't now. Uh, this is uh, over Yellowstone. Anyone seen a picture of that? You know what I'm talking about? That one I stayed high. I'm not talking to anybody there, but there was a uh, wildlife refuge area. I think I'm at 2,500 AGL Nashville. But anyway, when you can, stay low. It keeps it interesting. It makes it fun. Fun to see things. Uh, some elk in California. Uh, again, flying these cubs too, that gives it a little different of, of how low I'm talking about. Uh, so be, be uh, smart about what you're flying. I wouldn't be flying a twin engine down this low. It's another trip to Florida I took. Uh, that castle, by the way, is in uh, my training area. And uh, I make up all these funny stories uh, that are completely fake. but. Uh, <laughs> about who lives there and what it's there for but uh, the, the real story is whoever invented kitty litter uh, supposedly built that castle and the wife wanted a, re, re, uh, a, a replica of a German castle so they built in the Texas Hill Country. Now back to our meth that they're right here uh, on over their view that there's a meth house right there it's terrible. So, um, uh, Continue on to keep the fun factor of building an, the aviation fellowship. You know, building that network of people. Um, we we love flying and, and groups and having a reason to go fly. If you're just by yourself and you don't have anyone to fly with, you're probably not going to fly as much because you don't have a, a reason or a resource. Again, the RF is great for that. Some there's many state pilot groups. Idaho has a good one. New Mexico, Utah have good ones. Uh, these fat tire cowboys, anybody heard of them? They're, uh, they're big in Texas. It's just a group of uh, pilots, like six of them I think, maybe, that are all part of this, you know, just self-branded group that we're going to call ourselves the fat tire cowboys. And they have uh, different airplanes, not just super cubs or anything like that. They have a, like a Citation actually and a 185 and they do have a super cub and I think a glider now too. But uh, So it's just a group of guys that get you know they hang out and and uh, like flying airplanes and they have a really neat channel that people go to and it kind of inspires others to, to fly social media like it or hate it uh, it's a, also a good resource to stay in contact to stay in the know um, I try to keep most of my social media just aviation related Instagram for me is, is a real good business tool I've, I've, I've get a larger uh, pool of applicants that you know, come from Montana or California or Arizona all the way to Central Texas and uh, social media is a, a tribute. Similar to migration, I mean we all come here from a thousand whatever miles and we, we try to learn something, we talk, we, we meet new people and we leave hopefully kind of on fire, re-energized and kind of fired up about teaching and maybe the airlines will you know hold back another year and we'll, we'll keep in the in the training uh, world. Uh, you know, just a few different uh, times. Uh, this was a really neat experience. You know, taking advantage of meeting people and building those experiences. I do float plane, or I did float plane training, and uh, we're flying a 1946 PA-12 on amphibs, and just so happens 
this Chris craft was flying and it was just this gorgeous morning and uh, my student saw it first we were gonna land and he saw the boat and uh, we're like oh wow that, that's an old looking boat that's awesome so we landed and of course the boat comes to us we're gawking at the, the boat but the boats you know excited that there's an airplane he has a 1946 Chris craft by coincidence and so we exchange rides and, and my student goes on the, the boat and he, you know, it's just another little 10 minute experience that, that uh, you know, gets put in the memory catalog. This guy, uh, I didn't know who he was, but uh, he was, he joined me in the, in the canyon that I fly uh, on, at the Green River near Moab. And we just, he happened to be on fingers and I called him up on fingers and, hey, red helicopter on the, over the Green River, are you up? And he, yeah, who's this? And, we talk and we, we, we talk for about 10 minutes and I have a little lunch spot on the on the sandbar that I take lunches and I say, hey, you wanna land here and, and meet for lunch? And he said, well, sure. So he gave me a ride in his helicopter and then two years later, he came down to Texas and uh, did his tail wheel with me. So it's kind of a neat, neat deal. You never know who you're gonna run into, who you're gonna meet. My wife is just like, never met a stranger, you know. Actually, later that night, funny thing, I stayed with this guy in his house uh, the weather was bad. I told him I had a, a hotel uh, room already picked that uh, Cub Crafters pay for. And he said, oh, no, come, you're not going to be flying anymore. Let's go grab a uh, dinner and he, you can just stay at my place. And I'm like, oh, sure, I'm Arnold. He, here's another pilot at the airport, but that may be taken a little too extreme. Of pants. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, organizing little trips, always fun. Uh, I, I center a lot of these trips around food, uh, unfortunately. Uh, building the aviator, you know, it, it, again, we're keeping them motivated. Uh, any of these different courses to take, mountain course, I, I want to do my glider next. Any one glider instructor, I haven't done that yet, but that's on my, my list to do. So much fun, that keeps them energized. So we're talking about teaching the fun factor. Uh, during the training, kind of showing them, being that mentor after the training. Um, we're doing this, to, we're building relationships with others that are in the flying community around us. We're building relationships with the people that we're working with. I think that's the best part about what we get to do. That's what really keeps me in the training world. Uh, I've been a CFI since 2007. So many opportunities, just like you guys, go to the airlines and I could have better benefits, better pay. But one uh, large reason to stay in this training world is, is because of you know, who you get to meet and, and talk with and work with. It's all about um, you. You are the fun factor. You are the mentor, the friend, the CFI that continues to engage them into this thing we call aviation to motivate them to continue. It's the people and the places along the way as well that, that they enjoy. Like, that's not beer. This is a root beer, by the way. <laughs> yeah. There's a uh, really neat stop at Amboy's in the middle of Mojave. It's completely away from everything. It's out of your way to go there. Um, and it's Amboy's uh, mobile station or something like that along Route 66. And they have a dirt strip that I would think a Bonanza probably could land there. I, I don't know, you, you need to look at it for yourself. But it's not just a, you know, meant for a super cup is my point. I wouldn't put anything with wheel pants on uh, in there. But uh, anyway, you can you land there and you get out and you're, it's a gas station that's out in the middle of the desert and uh, kind of a neat random stop. Um, and again, you know, this leads to that fun that we're, we're talking about leads to the motivation, which leads to proficiency, which of course is the safety part of the deal. So uh, we all benefit from this. We, we continue a relationship, relationship with our students and our students get more time and uh, become safer. So it's, it's good. It's all about the smiles. Uh, a lot of smiles I get to see. And again, that's, that's the fun part of uh, this. Any questions? Actually, it's a great program. For the uh, thing that I think I can make a suggestion. Sure, absolutely. We are the face of aviation for the most part, be either instructors or school owners or so on. Something that has worked out for us tremendously. We're in Stewart, Florida. Where, where are you at? I'm out of Stewart, Florida. I own Sky Blue Aviation. Okay. Um, we have been working closely with the um, 
school, uh, school sound there in the, in the school district to change the perception of aviation. It's an actual industry where they want to push these kids. And we have been bringing the high schools and the high school kids and putting them in place. And it uh, has been a great return to us because something that is, a lot of these kids who have never been exposed to it, now they're starting to fly train. They're starting to fly train. And the other one is exactly what you're saying. Uh, grabbing instructors and teaching is not just about learning to teach them to fly, but to teach them the fun side of flying. Yeah. And that gets them engaged. Some of them will pursue an aviation, uh, aviation career. Some of them will just finish their private and go to whatever else they want to do, but they'll keep them flying. So that's something that has worked out for us really good. Absolutely, yeah, good. The, the high school kids. Good point. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm Chairman Emeritus of NAFI. Oh, nice. A professional organization, right? And I'm going to say something that's going to be contrary. Sometimes we can be two professional flight instructors. Yeah. Too cool for school. I'm Joe Pilot, and that's a turnoff to build on this gentleman's comments. That's a turnoff to a lot of people. Any flight instructor who tells me that it isn't fun to see the house get small loses a lot of my respect. To be straight up, if you're not in this to enjoy what you're doing mm -hmm. and to pass that joy on to somebody else. I'm not saying being unprofessional. I'm not saying do yes. something is stupid. Yeah. I'm not saying do something is stupid yeah. play touch football and ski at the same time. That doesn't work, <laughs> okay? For those of us old enough to remember that a terrible accident. Yeah. The point is, the point is, is that being professional does not mean not having fun. You're not too cool for school. The other thing that I'll remind every flight instructor is just because, and I wrote an article about this years ago, just because it's your fifth time around Farmer John's field today doesn't mean your student isn't excited about it. Yes. That's their first time flying today. I, yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta, even if you're just tired of going out to the practice area, you, Sometimes you have those days, and you got to you got to make it fun for your student. Absolutely. So we, we say if, if you secretly hope your next uh, customer cancels for some weird reason, just because <laughs> you're tired or whatever, that's an automatic red flag. Yeah. You got to change you your attitude, think about or it. To adjust your schedule, or something. Or you know, I I've, I've done it. I've called my student up and said, you know what, I'm dead. I can't do it anymore today. Can we reschedule for tomorrow? Just be straight up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's only so many times you do turn around the point, right? And you can go to do it at the point, you know, or um, it's, a lot of it is repetitive for us. You know, I, I fly school in Denton, Texas, and I have six to eight instructors all the time, and I tell them, <clears throat> we have the privilege and the honor to insert ourselves into people's lives. Their time and their money is two of the greatest commodities God's given us. And so when they come, they want to spend their time and their money with you. Why do you think they have that airplane, airplane pre-flighted at the top of the hour and you're still sitting there inside the air conditioning? They are so excited to go out and get in a 110 degree day yeah. in that airplane and you get to go do it again. Sometimes you've got to return to the fun so the instructor can remember what the fun was really all about again. Right. So this is a, this is a very well, and uh, I worked with another flight school that they gave us three hours a month to go burn so that we wouldn't forget what the fun part about exactly. flying was so we're not doing the same thing over and over and that was a neat little uh, benefit of working there one other suggestion for just to break up your students you know they've learned how to land the airplane and say okay I, I have the privilege of being near lamp lamp the same listener lamp, lamp. i know what time you're slow yeah that's what we're going today to do a couple of touch wheels real quick yeah, because they want the count. The, the guys in the tower want the count anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so sure. here we go. Yeah, mixing it up and going to different places again. That's that's just as beneficial to the CFI to not go over the same farmer Joe's field. We like to uh, coordinate flyout, like adventure flyouts, and it's, it normally has a theme of some sort where it combines fun with a learning process. Could be flying through Canada or you know whatever. Oh, uh, or awesome. touring a factory or something. Uh, yeah. But man, it is a ton of work. Yes. And people end up sometimes not being able to go and it's well, like the logistics. But I really think it's worth it. I mean, you just have to figure out the cadence, right? Maybe it's twice a year or not. Yeah. <laughs> not like when you try to do safety seminars every month, or maybe just do once a quarter so you don't burn out. But like, figure out some cadence that works. But it's cool. People think it's awesome. 
even the people that end up not going think it's cool that we're doing it. Right? Well, and, and also, I mean, to, to show how that's in high demand, there's a flight school that they, their pretty much only mission isn't primary or any specialty training, it's uh, organizing trips. And you sign on with them, they organize a trip, you give them a flat rate, they pay for everything, and they you know, take you along on a little adventure for a week or 10 days or whatever you sign up for. So it's, uh, and they seem to make it work. So. Some of the best things I've ever done is on the private pilot, when you have to give five hours of cross country time, Park 61, is not take them 50 miles away, take them somewhere fun, make them yeah. pick somewhere. I, I'm not telling you where we're going, you tell me where we're going and what we're doing. And uh, two, two trips that stood out to me is one, we flew the shoreline in Chicago and then we went to Milwaukee and went to the Harley Davidson Museum for the day. And then, you know, flew home, exactly it's just what like, about. what is this? Yeah. Um, and then the other one was a really, a really random one, but we flew to like Nashville and then went kayaking on the river and then flew home. And it was just like, you know, you'd, you'd never expect to do this and it raises their level and it's like, okay, well now we can get this done because sure. you know, once you're hitting cross countries, you're just about done with your training. Yeah. So realizing the fun. And during that time that you got to go and see something, you get you know, a little time to relax and debrief and kind of reset everything for the trip back instead of just doing a touch and go and then, all right, let's head back. Yeah. So yeah, that's excellent. An IFR student, one last word for him. I had an IFR student last year as long his long IFR cross country was Omaha to Lakeland. Wow, that is long. <laughs> yeah, I had to think about that. Yeah, time. well, it was a two for some of fun. Yeah. I oh, so I had to stop and start thinking Georgia and switch seats and say, okay, I'm out of time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm PIC now, you just sit there and be quiet. <laughs> uh, good. Any more comments or questions? Cool. Well, thank you guys. Really appreciate you coming.